Hey, welcome back. This is Florida. Today, we're going to be talking about hurricanes, how Floridians prepare, or maybe how they don't prepare, John. Exactly. Maybe the way Floridians prepare is a little bit different than what somebody in the Midwest thinks of when they think of a hurricane. Yeah, so before you move to Florida, uh, we're here to help you understand how the locals do it, what Floridians are doing it. But before we get started, we love you being here, so go ahead and subscribe. Smash the like button. Absolutely. It helps us reach more people. Smash it. Like us, subscribe, leave a comment. We will engage. Let's chat in the comment section. Yeah, let, turn those notifications on. We're talking about hurricane season. Hurricane season runs from June 1st all the way to the last day in November. So here we are. Today's June 19th. We're a few weeks in. Yeah, a few weeks in. A couple of things, you know, tropical storms are a big issue. Rain every single day, it seems like, happens during yeah. hurricane season, especially it's during been the summer. Raining. So how do you prepare? How yeah. do the rigs prepare? I was on National Hurricane Center. They've got a website. I kind of check it periodically, maybe once or twice a week. And I notice already there's two systems out there with potential to be hurricanes. So I'm kind of like looking far out. Other people, it's probably not even on their radar yet. But I got some stats, Josh. Yeah, us, I kind of want to go over. Here's how most Floridians prepare. And actually, according to a study done by AAA, they do insurance and everything. They found that 20% of the people surveyed do absolutely nothing at all. And 24% do not heed uh, evacuation warning. So that means when the government, when the news weather channel already starts saying, hey, we got a storm coming, you need to evacuate. 24% of the exactly, population yeah. are like... I'm going to have a party instead. And we were talking about this before we started recording. I said 20%. It should be a lot higher. But in reality, you know, we do. I do things to prepare. Maybe I just don't track the storms. I'm not going to evacuate. I'm definitely in that 24%. Yeah. I got a little higher number for you as well, Josh, because this number might be closer to what you're thinking. Of those who do evacuate, 56% of them do not evacuate unless it's a Cat 3. So over half of the population, it's got to be an upper tier storm. And uh, there's some even, even 10% of the population surveyed said, hey, uh, unless it's a Cat 5, I'm not leaving. So that's 156 mile per hour wind. We saw some damaging storms last year, the last couple years. So preparedness, how are you preparing? So anytime, so like, what, like what we were saying, right? I'm not doing anything for a particular storm, but... I'm ready to go all the time. I mean, I've got flashlights. There's a generator, some candles under the sink. You know, that stuff the kids scatter it about, but it is there usually. And a lot of things happen when hurricane, hurricanes come. The news seems to become fear-mongering, like Tim yeah. Deegan would be on there telling you how the city Gets won't wild. remain. And stores staying, bought up and everything. So. so I would say one of the things that I do in the beginning stages when we're going to get hit is turn the news off at least don't look don't watch it all day long be aware of where the storm is so but getting scared what do you guys do yeah do part of being a local part of being a floridian i think you should prepare over time those big ticket items do not wait to try and go out and buy a generator once the storm is within a week see you need to be going out there january february you then you're sourcing something like that and collect it as you go so i've got a generator i've got gas cans i've got this stuff i've kind of collected over the years as i need needed it and i make sure it's running all the time you know once a month i'm starting that thing up making sure the carburetors etc are working good um actually need to fire it up but that's a level of like i am always prepared and then yeah. as a storm approaches i'm kind of in that group where i'm watching is it cat three four five are we an upper mm -hmm. tier storm and then i'm making you know some you know preparations and it depends you know i lived further inland for the last few years so Almost any storm wasn't going to be a problem with us. You would be surprised how much momentum and power the storm loses as it crosses land. But now that we live closer to the coast, we may change that up a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And what's really important here is there are very different parts of, of this wonderful city, right? You could live in Riverside, and we have notes in there about how Riverside flooded during That's Irma it. in 2017. You could live on the water. You could live many different places. You could live out in the country where it's not going to be a problem. No trees, no nothing to worry about. But bottom line is you need to be prepared to where you're comfortable for your family, whether that's having a generator in the garage and making sure iPads are charged or whether that's having family in, in the mountains that you can go to if you get scared. That's a little bit of how we prepare, a little bit of our opinions and how we base our facts and that stuff. But here's what you should be doing. If you have recently purchased a home or you're looking to come to the state of Florida, here's what you should be doing right now. You should be checking your insurance. Call your local insurance guy. See what kind of coverage you have. Josh, some 
good information. Most people think they're covered. They just get homeowner's insurance and they take the basic policy and they think they're covered. But what do yeah. we know we need? We need flood insurance. That's if it. we are if if you are in Riverside again, back to the Irma, it was I mean it was a crazy flood out there. If you had a hurricane insurance, you think you're good to go when the flood waters come in, you are not good to go. So the preparing that we're doing, even with insurance and all that, isn't necessarily for, okay, the storm's hitting at midnight on the whatever day. It's the aftermath. It's That's right. We're not going to have power for a week or we're going to get flooded likely. We need to be prepared for that, whether that's calling your insurance company, calling your insurance guy, and making sure you have a conversation, make sure you're paying the right amount. That's right. Historical data shows us that most of the damage is occurred by some type of water entry to the home and not actually the wind damage at all. As the storm moves along the coast and co makes landfall north-south, depending on which side of the state you're on, depending on which side of the storm you're on, different levels of storm surge. If you're in Tampa Bay, that's only an average depth of two foot when the water gets shoved up in there there's likely to be some huge floods but maybe in different areas of the state where there's a deeper part of the ocean or something it may affect it differently so you need to check this out you need to look at the historical data and then you need to talk to your insurance agent to find out do i have the right coverage in case there's a storm in case there's storm surge exactly exactly and you don't want to be left three days after a hurricane with no power a flooded carpet and not knowing what you're going to do with your insurance yeah, bottom line. Okay, we got a new segment today. Uh, my wife Shauna's in here. She's producing the show. Hey, Shauna. Hey. Yeah, hopefully soon we'll get uh we'll be fancy enough to have an extra microphone and camera to get her included more. But she's got a question for us, Josh. Right, now yes. I've seen this question. Josh hasn't seen this question. It has been completely hidden um, from me. I feel like I'm excited. So Shauna's going to ask the question. You can read, you know, Shauna, give us the question. Hit, hit me, Shauna. Cosign if a boyfriend has lousy credit. A man with a good job failed to qualify for a home loan because he has bad credit. What are the pros, cons if he's less wealthy, credit worthy girlfriend cosigns? Okay, so we've got a boyfriend with a great job and bad credit. Yeah. And we got a girlfriend with good credit. That's it. How's, how's her job? She doesn't have the money. She just has she the credit. No He's got, got the got money. Credit. She's right. got the credit. But this is right. so, this is just long term relationship, boyfriend girlfriend. Know everybody's got different. Don't yeah. You know, don't cancel us for bringing this up. But yeah. this is serious because we run serious. into yeah, into yeah, hundred percent. Like and and first of all, everybody's got a different scenario. I have been asked all kinds of crazy questions. Uh, this is not even close to that. So if this is your scenario, hit me up. If you got a wackier one, hit me up. So first of all, anytime there's a co-signer or co-borrower, two borrowers, um, we're taking the good with the bad. And what that means as far as a mortgage is this scenario, our gentleman's credit is bad. That's the bad. The good is the job, right? He, he has good income. And with the girlfriend, I don't know, what, does she have a name in the scenario? No. The girlfriend has no, not really income, not really assets, so that's bad, but good credit. So we're going to use for qualifying credit score. It doesn't matter if the girlfriend is an 800. doesn't matter. We're using the low score, the low middle score. So we have three Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian that we pull from. We throw out the high, throw out the low. We use the middle. And whoever's the lowest, that's your qualifying score. This scenario, let's assume that our gentleman is above, you know, he's not rock bottom. He's not 500. Um, but if he is... We would need to put you on a plan. It is not, we're not locking, locking you out. We're going to improve your credit, Nate. And that takes okay. work. Garbage in, garbage out. You want better, you got to get better the way you got sick. All the, all the things. You, you screwed up your credit. It's time to fix it. It's not going to be easy. Anyway, back to our, our scenario. Our guy, <laughs> our guy is qualified, let's assume. Um, and she is not. And they do want to co-sign. And we can make it work. What is the legal scenario behind that, being that they're boyfriend and girlfriend? We're going to travel down that road. I'm asking myself questions now, Shauna. So we can arrange that with title any number of ways. You guys could both be on title. You could have some situation where, hey, before before we even enter into this legal, legal, you know, tangled yeah. web, we're going to have a plan if things don't work out. And I'm saying that as a person who has been divorced. I think you've been divorced as well. Yeah. You know, both of the parties while they're buying a home, this is the biggest purchase they've ever made. You want to, Biggest first purchase. of all, be legally protected. You're in the love bubble. Great. Let's talk legally. <laughs> let's let's really talk about who gets the house, what's going on, who makes the mortgage payment. Because if y'all break up and somebody misses a mortgage payment, you're both your credit's screwed for a long time. 
Okay, cool. Bottom line. Josh. How's that? Was that too much? No, what I'm hearing is really that each scenario is different and each case is different. And yeah. so questions like that are hard for us to answer just right in like a one sentence answer. Exactly. Exactly. I want to say this. I'm so sorry, Nate. The, the most important thing here, and I say this about almost every scenario, even if, all right, our dude's got rock bottom credit 500. Yeah. Let's really work hard to improve it. It's still better than renting. Oh my God. Yes. If that's the only way we can buy a house, yeah. let's do it. It's better than renting to sign a lease together, whatever. The same damn thing. Better than renting, period. Yeah. Put Ab it on the screen. Better than renting. <laughs> Absolutely. If you're looking to get questions like that answered, uh, maybe you got some some other questions that come to mind you're wondering about, hit Josh up. I got his number here at the bottom of the screen. Shoot him a text. Call him today. I guarantee he'll answer. He answers my calls or uh, calls me right back if not available. Well, it was one time, Nate. Take it easy. I'm sorry. <laughs> He'll call you back I'll if he you misses back. your call. Yeah. Usually it's because he's on the other line because he works so hard. Holidays, Just, rain or shine, you got to call him. All right, all right. What else we got? Any other questions, Shauna? No, we got one other thing I want to talk today about really quick, and then we'll get out of here. The importance of a hyper-local knowledge, okay? Listen, you'll read a lot of headlines out there talking about how prices are declining and sales are declining. I'm here to tell you a, high, a local expert who knows the local area, hyper markets are existing right now. Because even here in Jacksonville, in Northeast Florida, if I take you into the Riverside, Avondale area, I showed some houses over this weekend um, that were sold less than a year ago. They were listed much higher. They could have used the same prices. There was like no change to the house at all. And the house got multiple offers and went under contract at above ask price. However, maybe just um, a little bit down the road in Clay County or something, we're not seeing the same prices yeah, we saw last year. We're seeing lower prices. So not only is it different from state to state, but even within a state, even within a city. Neighborhood. In it. So I got a could question. be street by street. This, this, this is a question that I get and often don't know how to answer. Nate, so as a realtor, as an expert in this local area, yeah. if let's say your daughter was old enough to buy a house, if your daughter wanted said, hey, I want to live in Riverside, period. That's it. I'm not okay. even looking at another house. She's going to say, Daddy, what, what should I do? Should I wait six months or should I do it right now? What are prices doing? Prices. It's your daughter. Prices there are continuing to go up. Through the and roof. I broke this down. I've got chat, charts, data. I'll share it with you uh, if you reach out to us. But listen, in the last 40 years, every decade from 1990 to 2000, 2000 to 2010, we saw a 40% increase. Even with the Great Recession, all of that, as prices come up and down over a 10-year period, they're going up about 40%. Yeah. It's, in, it's crazy. So if you're going to Riverside today, uh, the Jaguars just unveiled new plans yeah. for a new stadium downtown. You've got all the medical. You've got the historic districts. It's always going to be good there. And here's my thing. Here's my take on this because people say, man, well, what if it comes down? What if it comes down? If it comes down, it's all coming down. And everybody's in the same boat you are. So, like, that's the way it is. We'll cross that bridge while we're there. I, don't I mean, think we're going to have to. Listen, yeah. if the dot, like, you know, there was all in the news, there was all this, oh, the dollar, it's going to lose its value if they don't raise the debt ceiling or something. I'm like, if that happens, I mean, what are we going to do anyways, right? That's yeah. such a, like, out there scenario. The real scenario is I don't want you to be 20 years down the road. I don't want my kids to be 20 years down the road and be like, man, I, I was scared to do it then because I thought the market might crash yeah. or go down. But if, had I done it over the last 20 years, Man, what a great uh, wealth building tool that would have been. I, I listened to a podcast uh, this morning and they were talking about looking at a, pre, a real estate appreciation and people look at it like quick now, now. This is not day trading. Yeah. Is what they were saying. Don't compare That's it to it. day trading. You know, you're investing in this for many years. Three to five years minimum, 10 plus, even better. Again, I'm not the realtor, but you got to be crazy to think that this area, North Florida, Florida in general, is going anything but up in the next three five years currently in month i think yeah we're out of time today but maybe next episode josh will talk more about that because i was just reading some other articles and some data about how many permits were pulled in the jacksonville area it was like thirty-seven thousand permits for building houses i mean the growth here it's incredible and anytime you've got where they're building and building and you're getting in during that time period once it's established and it's built out they can't build anymore 
Yeah. And so. All right, we got it, Nate. We got to get out of here. I'm having a good time. Let's yeah. let's turn the camera. We can keep chatting about this. We can we, we can record another. If we let's change shirts and do another episode. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Hey, thanks for tuning in again. This is Florida. We love talking about Florida real estate investments, all those things, kind of mixing them together a little bit. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Give us a call. We'd yeah. love to chat with you. Reach out with any questions. We talked about some mortgage style questions. Any questions you have for Nate about prices going up, prices going down? Reach out. We'd love to talk. 